My name is Julia Silge and I'm a data scientist and software engineer at our studio. And in this video today, we're going to use this week's Tidy Tuesday data set for, about um, volcano eruptions. And we're going to talk about how to train um, a multi-class or a multinomial classification model. A lot of things um, are the same when you're uh, training a um, classification model uh, for labels where you have more than just two um, classes in the label that you're predicting. But um, we'll talk about some of the things that are different. Um, and so let's get started with this data set of volcanoes. Okay, let's look at some volcanoes here. So this data, um, uh, there's several data sets here, but the one that I'm going to look at is the, um, the data set of, um, of actually, uh, not eruptions over time, but actually where the volcanoes are. And one of the, um, uh, columns that we have here is the uh, the primary volcano type. So if we look at this, we have um, there. There's quite a number in here, but you can see that there's several different sort of main categories that we have. There's um, strato volcanoes. There's shield volcanoes. We have a couple of them here. There's field volcanic fields, um, calderas, and so forth. And um, um, what, what we're going to do in this video is we are going to use other information that we have about the volcano. For example, we have um, information about the elevation, about um, where the volcano is, about um, the kind of rocks, the kind of rock that the volcano is in. And we're going to see what, like, how good of a job can we do building a model to predict what kind of volcano um, it is based on this. Um, but in set, this isn't going to be just like a, a binary classification model where we only have um, two kinds. Um, there's a whole bunch of kinds here. So um, this is an example of um, a multi-class or a multinomial um, a classification problem where, where we have um, not just one versus the other, but, um, but three or more um, classes. So let's start. Um, uh, 26 is really too many, given that we only have like less than a thousand um, uh, uh, rows of data here. So we're not going to try to do all of these. So um, let's start to build a new... Um, Let's start to build a new variable. Let's actually, let's use transmute here. Let's, um, so let's call it volcano type, type, and let's use case when. So uh, let's say, and then let's use string detect. So when we detect in this primary volcano type, when we detect, um, let me move this over a little bit. When we when we detect um, stratovolcano like this, let us um, let's let's call it stratovolcano. And when we string detect um, in the same string. Uh, let's see. Let we. I think we could do the shields. The shield volcanoes. Let's call that shield. Um, do we want to try to do any others? Let's let's start with this for now. So let's. We're, we've gone from. We're not going to do binary classification. We are going to do three um, uh, classes. So this is uh, instead of one, um, instead of one versus the other, we're going to do um, three, three classes that we're going to build a model to find here. Uh, we could keep going, you know, we could maybe try to find all the calderas that are here or whatever, but we, with shields, we're already down to, you know, 120 or so. So let's, um, let's just go with three for now. And then let's think about what else in here we want to um, include in our in our modeling so let's take a look and see so um the like the number and the name would be identifiers and this is what we're going to transform to um uh to predict somewhere 
uh, we uh, I don't know um, so we got a lot of information here about um, location um, instead of these things like region or country let's just actually use latitude and longitude um, so this numeric measure of where these things are let's keep elevation I like that idea um, let's keep this tectonic setting see if we can do something with that um, I don't think we'll do anything with evidence category that's um, whether uh, like how sure you know how do we know if it's when the last time it you know erupted or not and then let's look at these rocks okay so there's a lot of empty values but it looks like in the first column we at least have something in the first column for for looks like mo pretty much all the volcano so let's keep that so um let us let's let's keep that volcano number in case we want it as an id um we definitely want latitude and longitude uh an elevation and then let's get the tectonic settings and the and the rock but just that first one because the other ones a lot of them were empty so we'll just keep one so this will be this will be the data that we will keep so and use in our modeling so uh, this is this is kind of nice to look at because we've got a mix of some numeric um, predictors a mix of some things that are currently like um, uh, categorical um, uh, so before we go on let's do an is if it is character let's change it to a factor and let's call this um, volcano DF so we are going going to this will be our um, our modeling our, our data will use for modeling so we're gonna predict volcano type using the other things so before we go on, let's just do a little bit of exploration. I mean, when you've got when you've got um, spatial information like that, the least the least thing you want to do is you want to make a map. Um, so let's see, map data, yeah, world. So uh, this is all over the world. So let's let's make a little bit of a map here and see uh, where we can uh, look at where these um, volcanoes are and at least do that much um, exploration before we get started on our modeling. Uh, so I'm gonna make a, um, I am gonna make a map that has two layers and they are going to have different, um, they are going to have different um, data. So normally when you do ggplot, you put the data right here, but we are gonna, um, so one of them is gonna be a map and then one of them is going to be points. And so the, the points are gonna come from here and then the map is gonna come from here. So, uh, so you, can, you can send, so I can say data equals world, like so, and then data equals um, volcano df, like this. So you can, um, uh, I, I don't think I've demonstrated how to do this before, um, and you may not have seen it, but you can actually combine um, different data sets into the same, um, the same uh, plot using ggplot in this way. So for the map, Let's, I, we also say map equals world, and then you start uh, defining the aesthetic. So if I remember right, let's look at what we have here. Uh, okay, so we've got, so on the x-axis we'll put longitude, on the y-axis we'll put latitude, and then our map ID here is, we need to say something called map ID, and it's gonna, it's this region thing. So we'll take region and put it here, like so, and then we can start to say some things about, um, like if I only plotted this, I'll just show you what that looks like. I think that will do something. Um, there we go like so so we have we have beginning of a of a of a map which is looking pretty good already um so we can start to um make it a look at make it look a little bit nicer for example if i want let's see let's make the um the color which is of the uh the lines white let's make the fill of how, light light gray and um, let's make them a little bit like let's make it pretty transparent because because the next thing we're gonna do so that changes like the 
changes it to light gray. The, so then the next thing we're going to do is for the, we're, we're going to put points on top of it. So we're going to say AES, um, and then we're going to say longitude, because in our, let's remember, remind ourselves what's in this. So we have um, longitude, The they have different column names here, so that's why this looks different. Longitude, latitude, and then um, let's make uh, different point, different colored points for different volcano types, and let's make them a little bit transparent too, so that if we um, want to, uh, if they plot on top of each other, we see them in um, in a different. We, we see them a little bit on top of each other. So let's zoom in here so we can see this a bit. And this is looking pretty good here. So um, there is for sure spatial information here. I like the main thing I know about volcanoes is that they're arranged in a ring of fire. Um, uh, the ring of fire here is like split in half. If you start, you know, down here, it kind of it's you know goes around the Pacific Ocean, like uh, you know uh, on this edge here, and then it goes around, comes over here, and goes back around this way. So you for sure see that, um, and then we see them sprinkled around elsewhere around the world. Um, we de you de we definitely see some spatial information in how the different types are organized. Um, you know. There's shield volcanoes out in the middle of the ocean and in Antarctica, the stratovolcanoes, you see big, that was the most common, so you, I guess it makes sense that they're clustered together. And then there are a lot of other, um, I, this, you know, I live in this part of the US and I think we have volcanic fields, I think, um, and whatnot around here. So uh, some of the other things are pretty strongly clustered. So it will be interesting to see if we can use some modeling to learn about, you know, some of these differences that we see, some of these spatial differences, or if some of the other things matter too, like, um, you know, elevation or the, the rock or the, the other things that we have here. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, so that's that looks good. So let's let's call that um, exploration for now um, and start to build a model. So we do not have a ton of data here. Um, and so uh, what what I'm gonna do here is instead of um, instead of splitting into testing and training data as um, we often would if we wanted to build a predictive model. I am going to um, cre instead create bootstrap resamples of this of this data frame that we made. Let's call it volcano boot, like this. And um, what this is going to do is uh, create twenty five bootstrap resamples, and we have. Um, you know the the two the two sets that is divided up into here, and so instead of having like training data and testing data, and we're going to evaluate, we're going to train on the training data, evaluate on the um, testing data. What we're going to do is in each of these bootstrap samples, we're going to um, train on the analysis set of the bootstrap resample evaluate on the assessment set of the bootstrap resample and then see what we get here and um, use that as a, a measure of what um, how good of a like how how um, how, how well our multi-class um, model can perform um, so the good thing to keep in mind if you do something like this is that it's, it's probably pessimistically bias the estimates that we're going to get out of it um, wh when we have such um, small data like this um, I I'm just going to demonstrate with um, doing it uh, this way uh, so the so we have our data now the, this, this, these bootstrap resamples that we have created um, the the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get ready to pre-process this data. So, because remember, what's in each of these, um, each of these splits? It's a bootstrap resample of this data. That is a a mix of um, of uh, numeric data, of categorical data, and one thing I want to draw your attention to: volcano DF count volcano type is that um, there's quite a f 
the number of shield volcanoes is quite a bit lower than the other two. And um, I, I would like to um, deal with that class imbalance in this multi-class um, problem. So um, uh, I'm going to use a uh, I'm going to use a recipe step from the Themis package, which is uh, uh, a package for with recipe steps just for dealing with class imbalance. And so the the one I'm going to use is called Step Smote. And so it's uh, the Smote algorithm is um, it it generates new examples of whatever minority class you have using uh, nearest neighbors there. And so to do that, what we need to do is we need to um, convert all of the everything to numeric. So we need to make um, indicator variables, dummy variables, and then we, let's also um, center and scale all of our um, all of our numerical our variables here. So let's get started with this recipe. So first, recipe, right? We say, hey, I'm making a recipe. So we say, I want to predict volcano type with everything else, and the data that I'm using is is volcano DF. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to update role for this volcano number um, because I want to keep it in my data, but I, um, I it's not a predictor or an outcome, so I need to give it a new role. Um, okay, so what else do I want to do here? Um, uh, how many volcano DF, uh, how many tectonic settings are there? 11. That's, uh, that's kind of a lot given how much data we have. So let's use step other on tectonic settings. What that does is, is it collapses some of these levels that are not used very much um, down together into an other category. So it'll keep, you know, the, um, the big categories and then it will collapse the very small categories down. I'm just going to use the defaults, but you can play, you can um, uh, set exactly where that threshold is set. Oh, let's do the same thing for the rock. How many levels are there? What, how many kinds of rock are there? 10, again, I think that's kind of a lot. And some of these are, you know, only used two or six times. I, I don't want to keep that in my model. So um, let's step other the rock as well. Um, next, I, 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 I have these um, uh, categorical ways that this is encoded, but I want to have numeric, I want to have numeric values. Um, so I am going to do step dummy on um, these two, on these two um, variables that are currently factors. And I want them to, instead of factors, I want them to be, um, so I'll have, instead of one column that has all these levels, I'm going to have you know, seven or six columns that are going to have ones and zeros in them instead. Um, let's do a step ZV to remove um, everything, any anything that has zero variance. And then let's normalize all the predictors so that they are uh, centered and scaled. And then finally, at the end of all of this, let us use that SMOT algorithm to um, to uh, oversample so that um, from the minority classes so that they all have um, we have uh, so that it's balanced and let's call this the volcano recipe like so so uh, the volcano recipe so what I've done so far is I've defined all the steps but none of them have been estimated or like we haven't gone to the data and for example calculated the center and scales for what we for what we will what we need to do um what the way to do that is that we prep so when we prep the recipe like this whoops not when we prep the recipe then 
um, uh, we have, we've gone to all the variables and we have calculated, we figured out how many factor levels do we need to collapse? When did we, what was the average and the, you know, standard deviation that we needed to do? And then um, how did we, um, how did we need to up oversample to um, get the, the, uh, uh, the classes to be balanced? Um, if you want to kind of check out what happened and check on your results, you can juice a prepped recipe and get back out your results. Um, notice we have more rows than we did before, and that's because of the oversampling. So if we wanted to currently, we can count a volcano um, type here, and now look, it's even, and that's because of the oversampling that we did. Also, notice how many more columns we have now. Before, we had seven columns, and now we have 14, and that's because we made the dummy variables, the indicator variables. Instead of having one column with tectonic settings in it, we have, well, you know, one, two, three, four, five, like five-ish, and now we have four or so columns for rock with the different kinds of rock that we have here. And so uh, we can use all that and notice that all the numbers are all centered and scaled. And so this is a good fit for the, um, the SMOTE algorithm, um, which is nice. So this is all, this is already now. We were able to oversample using uh, that nearest neighbor algorithm so that we have um, even numbers here. So hopefully we can do a good job of recognizing, you know, the shield volcanoes, even though there's a fewer number of them, um, and not just the strato volcanoes. Okay, so that's data pre-processing, such an important part of any modeling workflow. Um, next, let's talk about mo the model, the model specification we're gonna use. Um, let's use a random forest. Um, let us, so let's do set mode classification, because we are, um, uh, doing, um, we're trying to tell the difference between stratovolcanoes, shield volcanoes, and the rest of everything else, other. And let's use ranger. Um, so, so, uh, random forest using the ranger, um, engine works for a multi-class, multi or, and or multinomial classification just out of the box. It just works as is. Um, you don't have to do anything for it. And also it, um, it works quite well with, like you don't really gain a ton tuning the hyperparameters as long as you have enough trees. So um, it's a really nice fit for a problem like this. It's, this isn't really very much data to use with a random forest. Um, so that's kind of, maybe a downside here, but um, uh, it is, is, can be a very good fit for what we, for the problem space that we have here. So we're gonna make ourselves a random forest model specification. Um, we, we up to the number of trees and we're training a classification model. It's um, just going to uh, successfully do multi-class instead of binary classification for us as is. And then, um, for convenience, let's put our recipe here, our unprepped recipe, um, together with our model here, this random forest specification, into a workflow. Let's call it volcano workflow. Um, uh, be, as a way to carry around our bits of um, modeling workflow. A workflow is a, um, uh, a, like think of it as like a little uh, set, a way to hold together things that stick together like Lego blocks, like your recipe and your model stick together and it's easier to carry them around in your, um, code and in your modeling workflow. And you can fit a workflow much like you can fit a model. So let's, whoops, that's not what I meant to do. Let's do that. So we are going to use the function fit resamples. Um, and the first argument is the workflow. The second argument is the resamples, which for us, remember, is this set of bootstrap resamples. Um, and then 
the only other thing I want to do here is I want to uh, save the predictions because um, volcano result. Um, oh, you know, maybe let's do a uh, verbose. As also since we're going to be sitting here and watching it going so um, I'm saving the predictions because I want to uh, look at what um, uh, which which individual volcanoes were predicted correctly or not and so if I save the predictions in this way then I am able to um, get get that out which is convenient and nice and if we use uh, verbose equal to, we can see how close to the end we are, which is pretty nice. All right, we got through all uh, 25 bootstraps. Just to emphasize what's happening here, um, we for any individual um, bootstrap, first we look at the recipe. The recipe is um, evaluated. We look at the model. The model is evaluated. And then, um, then predictions are made. Um, uh, using the fit model on the um, on, on for that bootstrap resample on the part of the data that was not used to fit. So that happens 25 times here uh, for our 25 resamples. All right, so let's look at what we got. Okay, so uh, notice the beginning of this looks similar. We have the bootstrap resamples, but now we have metrics, notes, where anything that goes wrong uh, is kept around. Fortunately, we have zero notes, and then the predictions are here. So um, we have here, so each of these is only like 350 or so because that's what is in the um, analysis set, kind of the, um, you can think of that as like a testing set um, for each of these bootstrap resamples. So how did the predictions go there? So what can we do with this? Volcano result. The first thing we can do is we can just collect the metrics. So these are the default metrics. So this, this is probably the biggest place that what we're doing with um, multinomial classification is different than what we would be doing with binary classification. The metrics that you need to use um, are different than um, <clears throat> than what uh, than what you would use uh, for binary classification. The yardstick package, which is part of tidy models, um, has has uh, like excellent full featured support for multi class uh, metrics, performance metrics. Um, so, for example, you can see that. Um, uh, you know, fit resamples could tell that this is a multi-class uh, problem. This is a like, multinomial classification. And instead of just doing um, regular binary accuracy, it did multi-class accuracy. And so here is the value that we got for multi-class accuracy. Perhaps nothing to write home about, but this is what this is what we got. And then um, uh, area under the curve for an ROC curve. This is something that um, uh, you have to decide. How are you going to extend this to um, uh, uh, the multi-class situation? And there are several ways to do this. And the default is this uh, hand till um, uh, estimate, like way to do it. And uh, the yardstick actually has a great um, article, a great um, vignette that talks about multi-class um, metrics. And I encourage you to, to read it. Um, it is very helpful for understanding how these things, um, how these things work. Um, what, what else can we do with this? So let's, uh, let's talk about, um, so we have the predictions as well. So we can collect the metrics, but we also can collect the predictions. So here we have, let's look at how this is different. So this, this row, that's the row in the original data. And this, um, we have the predicted class and volcano type, that's the true class that we got, had from the, in the initial, um, uh, the original data. And so we have prediction, predicted probabilities for every um, of the classes and you know which which one was highest so this top, this top one was other because the 
other was highest and this one is stratovolcano because it's highest and so forth so one of the things we can do here is we can do a um a confusion matrix so uh for starters let's just put everything together like all the all the bootstrap samples together and look at a confusion matrix so if we we first we say the truth so volcano type and then we say the predicted class like so and so we get a um a confusion matrix here so let's think about this so here's the truth up here and here's what was predicted so other other it you know you can you can tell it you can see here why we got accuracy you know kind of you know okay-ish but eh, you like we're better than we're better than guessing but mm, you know maybe not fantastic like so yes so most of the other volcanoes were classified as other volcanoes but that's you know that's quite a lot that were classified as stratovolcanoes the stratovolcanoes it, it was the easiest to classify them and remember we actually had the most of them in the real data set and even though we used um uh, uh, oversampling, the SMOTE algorithm oversampling, it was still easiest for us to identify those. The shield volcanoes, it looks like the proportions are probably about the same there. The shield volcanoes, you know, it was the most, co like we did the best job. I mean, it was the most common choice was to say shield volcanoes are shield volcanoes, but certainly, certainly um, we're not uh, blowing it out of the water here or anything like that. Um, uh, so, so these metrics were the default ones. Like I didn't, I didn't say anything like, uh, tell me specific fancy metrics, but you, if you save the predictions, you can always come back and, um, uh, we can collect the predictions and then you can always, um, calculate predictions after the fact like say we want to find the positive predictive value and we do the same thing where we say the truth uh, the truth and then the predicted class like so so that's and again this is a this is a way of weighting these for the for the multi-class situation and you also can do things like um a uh, group group by um the uh uh, the resample. So now we have for every ID, what is the estimate? So we could, you know, look at how is that distributed and, you know, get some, get some understanding of how that, you know, you could do a quick, you know, a quick uh, histogram of that and understand how much this is, um, how, the, how this is distributed over here. Uh, we only have 20 <laughs> that's that's not great is it because we only have 25 but we can you know you can look at things that we have like that okay so that is um uh the predictions um uh, something else we would like to know more about is um what was what uh what can we learn about um uh, how, what can we understand about this model? Because this is a, you know, as a random forest model, uh, all these trees are voting together. It can be a little bit more difficult to um, to understand what's driving the predictions, but we can use variable importance to, to understand our model. So we, the VIP package, variable importance, um, can um, help us to do this. So if we go to, to do this, we have to go back to the spec. So if we go to the to the model spec and then reset the engine, we keep it at Ranger, but we have to we have to say, ah, I I want to set I want to calculate importance this time because we didn't set the importance um, up here. It's it's slower, so we probably don't want to do it every time. And then we fit. Um, it like you, much like we fit a model. I mean, fit a workflow. You can just fit a model specification. Um, and let's do volcano type explained by everything. And then the data that we do that we do this on. Uh, we're not going to do it for all the bootstraps. Instead, we're going to do it actually on the on just the data set as a whole, just the si at a single time. We're only going to do this a single time. So we are going to take this this prepped data set, we're going to juice it 
like so. And then we need to um, get out, we do not want the number, the volcano number. And then um, uh, let's clean these names because they're kind of a mess like so. Okay, so this is the data we're going to train this on. Like so. So let's call it data equals just to clarify for ourselves. So um, uh, what this is going to do, and then I can pipe this to, the, so this is a fit. I'm fitting. I'm fitting the random forest again. I'm fitting it again one time instead of a, a bunch of times on models to, so the purpose up here was how um, how good of a job am I doing on fitting? Um, which 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 uh, parts of the classifier do a good job and do a bad job? Like which which categories? What I'm doing here by fitting again one time on the mod on, on the just the the single data set. What I'm doing is saying what can I learn about what mo what um. Uh, what variables are important. The reason I'm using the juice data is so that I can get, uh, I can compare um, the subduction zone, um, you know, being being in the, the continental crust versus the oceanic crust and um, compare those things to the importance of latitude and longitude. So I pipe this to the VIP function and I'm going to say um, uh, geome equals point because I think that looks nice. Um, okay, so let's run this. Uh, it has to fit the random forest one more time. So it's, this is a small data set, so that is fast. Um, but let's take a look at our result here. Okay, so um, so the big, the big two here are latitude and longitude. So the biggest thing that is impacting the um, predictions are where the volcanoes are. Um, interestingly, the second thing, which is not that far behind, is the this rock, basalt. I think that's how you say it, basalt? I'm not a, I'm not a geologist. And then, then we have some things behind there, like um, the continental crust and then elevation. So, so you, we can understand what is it that is um, having the biggest impact on um, the predictions for this random forest model, which is um, always good to be able to do and look at and understand. Given that latitude and longitude are so important, let's wrap this up by making one more map. Um, and we're going to make the map with the bootstrap free samples. Uh, so this should be, this should be good. I, you know, I, we, we so seldom have the opportunity to do something a little bit fancy with plotting that whenever, whenever the opportunity lends itself, I think we should definitely do it. Okay, so let's take those, um, let's take those results. Let's look at the predictions again the predictions, there we go, and let us, um, let us think about, okay, so volcano type, uh, you can't quite see this because, okay, so when these two co uh, columns are the same, then we did, we were correct, the model was correct. When they're different, like here, there, it's incorrect. So let's make a new column, mutate, let's call it correct, and um, let's make it, vol it's going to be a uh, logical. Um, so when volcano type equals predicted class like this. So this is my new column. So overall, how did we do? I think we know this from accuracy already. Yes, about like 60% or whatever. Okay, great. Um, notice we have this dot row. This is the row from the original um, data, volcano dot underscore, or volcano DF. So if we, we can make a mutate dot row, row number like that. And then we can join these up together. So left join like so, and let's 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 uh, join these guys up together. 
Let's run this. Uh, all right, yep, that's an okay join. Um, and so now what we have is for everything, for every, for every um, boot sample, for every bootstrapped prediction, which is a lot because we did it 25 times, we have whether it was correct or not, and we have where it was. Let's save this. Let's call this volcano predictions, like so. So this, what this data frame has in it is um, every bootstrapped prediction, whether it was correct and where it was. And then let's make a map of this. So let's go back up to our map. Let's uh, copy this. Paste it down here. Um, but let's, we're going to change it a little bit. So instead of this um, geom point thing, we're going to use one of this, a stat, a stat summary. So stat summary, so let's see, they, these, these, um, uh, let us read, let's read this. The data are divided into bins defined by X and Y, and then the values of Z in each cell are summarized with a function. That's exactly what we want to do. So um, we can, we can start with a stat summary 2D, and then we can try a different one. So the data that we want are these predictions. Um, and the AES is the same as before. Longitude, latitude. The Z here is this correct. Correct. Whoops, nope. Correct, like this. And the, f oops. Let's see, what did I do wrong? Ah, okay. Um, and then the function that we want is mean. We're going to take the mean, like, so we get like what percentage is correct. And then let's like do like, uh, we, this should be somewhat transparent, like so. So let's try that. Whoops. Okay, this didn't quite work. I think I need to say as integer here. So force it to be ones and zeros. There, there we go, there we go. This is, this is right. This is right, okay. Nice, very nice, I like it. Okay, um, so in these little uh, squares, what we've done is we have taken um, the mean in each little square as to whether it is, uh, uh, so when it's more blue, then a, it is more correct, and when it's more dark, it is less correct. So we're able to understand across the world um, if it is more or less. Where, where were we more correct and where were we less correct? Let me see if I can make this look decent here for you. Um, okay, so let's, uh, so that, those 2D, those 2D summary is nice, but um, like, like many of us, I love, I love some hexagons. So let's change it to hexagons. I, I mean, obviously this is better because it's hexagons. Obviously. Um, I think you can, I think you can change bins and you can make them like more, more hexagons. And if some, if we have some hexagons, obviously more hexagons is better. <laughs> that might be too many. I don't know. Can you have too many hexagons? So hard to say. Um, okay, so the scale fill, we can change that gradient. Like, for example, you could keep the, the low color, that dark gray, and change the high to um, cyan. And the other good thing by using this is you can change the labels. Uh, and for, for example, I want, to, I want to be more clear that that's a percent there. 
Okay. Excellent. Excellent. I think this is really coming along. Um, okay. So you can see that here in the West in the U.S., Remember, that was a lot of other. We, we did a really good job of saying those were other. And these shield volcanoes down here in Antarctica, we did a great job of finding those because they were not mixed up with other things. But some of these areas where things were mixed up a lot, it was much harder for us to uh, say um, what they were or not. So you can kind of see across the, across the world where things were and were not um, easier to... Uh, to uh, uh, to predict in this three class classification model. Um, if you wanted to change the um, the title on the um, the color bar there, you can just put in um, a uh, uh, something put in something there with uh, with labs. You can say something like percent classified correctly here. And you can get a uh, let's zoom this in one more time and take a look. Let that render. Okay. Um, okay, so one one thing, I, I'm not going to do this because I always have to look it up every single time I do this, but one thing that could make this map better would be to do a better projection. Um, I think that, G, that the hex, the hexes require a Cartesian um, uh, projection, so we would have to look into something else if we did that. But um, this is we're we're just project we put have put the whole Earth on um, uh, fixed coordinates here uh, with x y, and um, I'm sure you know that's not great. Um, uh, you know a everything in Africa looks tiny and Antarctica look looks enormous and whatnot. So um, that would be a way to make this map better would be to use a better projection. But then we would have to be we would have to think about how we did the um, uh, the hexes because uh, I think that we could not just use the hexes if we used cord map and uh, change the projection there. But overall I am really happy with this visualization as an output. Okay, we did it. Um, we just trained a model to predict the um, what type of volcano uh, uh, each volcano was. And this was a multi-class or multinomial classification problem. We used oversampling um, in our pre-processing because uh, uh, we didn't have the same number of um, volcanoes in each category. We used the SMOTE algorithm for, um, for that oversampling. Uh, when we're working on multi-class or multinomial problems, uh, the, the metrics that we want to use to evaluate how our models are doing, like accuracy or area under the curve, have to be adjusted for that multi-class situation. And that's one of the things we have to think most carefully about when we're working with it on, on problems or with data or models that have, uh, that are not just binary classification, one um, label versus another, but instead um, uh, many, many labels. I hope this was helpful and I will hope to see you next time.